Well, thank you, Bill, for the introduction and thank you for having me here. It's nice that uh, you have shown up to our very cozy seminar room. And I'm going to present to you today some facts on, uh, on our projects of Terahertz CT. But since this is a little longer than the normal seminar, I have uh, been so open to include also some of the surroundings of this Terahertz CT because this is only part of a larger project which is going on at our institute, which is um, at, in my case, the Johann Radon Institute in Linz. Namely, there is a special research project, Tomography Across the Scales, which encompasses a lot of um, tomographic problems. And there is a logo on the bottom, which you cannot see from here. But I would first like to um, tell you a little bit about this SFB tomography across the scales, show you first a couple of those projects which are ongoing. And then it's only one point, but the main thing will then be phase contrast terror density. But I thought it might be interesting since this is a workshop on tomography to show you some of the other tomography projects as well. So I hope you like it. Okay, so first of all, what is the SFB tomography across the scales. So as you can see here, it's a la rather large um, research collective of four mathematical groups. That would be the Hannes Kepler University, the Radon Institute, the University of Vienna, and the TU Berlin, with four physics or medical physics oriented groups. For example, you can see the medical universities of Vienna, and Innsbruck or the TU Vienna, which does um, technical university, which works on microscopy. And the idea was that uh, tomography, as we all know, it, it kind of exists on different scales of, of length. So from something very small, to like a cell to all the way into the galaxies. And mathematically, lots of these tomography problems share similarities, right? There's the Radon transform appears in many of them. And the idea was to get together people and transfer the knowledge that exists at one scale of tomography to another scale, always with a focus on what our physicists actually want. And showcased this is by the logo of our SFB. So here you see four different length scales where we are doing tomographic imaging problems. So on the top left, this is in fact super resolution microscopy at the nanometer scale, where these white dots, which you see there, are proteins in cell membranes. So this is really, really tiny. And I will tell you a little bit more about this later. Then we go to the micrometer scale, where you see a pollen grain on the top right, which 3D structure our physicists are interested in. The bottom left is the millimeter scale, where we do tomography of skin, mainly with optical coherence tomography. And then we make a jump to the light year scale where we're interested in tomography of galaxies, in fact. So you see there is a lot of stuff going on, but the combining part is tomography. Okay, so now I would like to showcase you just three pro uh, projects from our SFB and just on one slide each to show you a little bit what happens in these areas. So. The first thing, this was this nanometer scale. And as you may recall, I said that we are interested in where are certain proteins at the cell membranes. And well, you have the problem that these proteins are so small that you are below the diffraction limit of light. So if you just shone a light on it, like with a normal microscope, then all the proteins would reflect light back and you wouldn't see anything. It would be a big blur. So the idea of super resolution microscopy is you mark these uh, proteins with a color and then they start to randomly emit light, but crucially not all at the same time. So suddenly like what, what before would have been hundreds of thousands of proteins all lighting at the same time may now be just as you can see in the picture here, maybe just three of them. And you see that they are well separated in space. So you can fit the PSF model to it and get a nanometer precision um, positional estimate. And our physicists liked that. The problem is it goes only to around 10 nanometers. 
But what the physicist really would like to know, how are these proteins arranged? So like hexagonal structure, are there different things? And for this, you need to be closer. You need to be about one nanometer precise. And what they did is they just uh, froze the sample, which is the thing on the right. They use the cryostat and you freeze those um, proteins in space. However, then they don't rotate anymore as well. And the rotation was what made their PSF to look Gaussian. So now you'd have a fixed thing, but it's no longer Gaussian. So it may lie some weird way inside the object. And one part of our project was to estimate the location, which in this formula would be the X and the, the focus and the different angles from measurements of these kinds. And we have been uh, making some progress there. And one example paper I have placed you on the on the bottom, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Showcase two, we're jumping very far to light years. This was, um, well, this is a project we have with the astrophysics department of the University of Vienna. Our physicists would like to know, if you look at a galaxy, has this galaxy had a crash in the past? Galaxies don't form out of nowhere. And it is quite likely that galaxies have collided over time. And so if they have collided, then you can see traces of this collision in the density of the, uh, of the galaxy. Because you would see all one part of the galaxy has a higher velocity on average than another, which means that this is probably from a galaxy that came in on a tangent, or it has a higher age or a higher metallicity. And everything is a metal, which is not hydrogen for an astrophysicist. Okay, so as you can see in the formula, this boils down to solving an integral equation of the first kind, more or less. And uh, with a rather high, um, like there are quite a bit more unknowns as there are data points. So you need to place in really all the prior information you can get and something we got. And uh, if you are interested in more details, you can read up on it. And a third showcase is elastography. So this is um, mainly a project that goes on at the group of Otmar Scherz in Vienna. And what we do here, we are looking at skin and skin may have cancerous inclusions. And what happens, so, well, you would like to know if the inclusion is a cancer or not, preferably without first cutting it open. And you can, of course, try to see if there is something under the skin, if you touch it and but you would like to ideally know how stiff is it? Because if it has a certain stiffness, it's gonna be a cancer. And if it has a different stiffness, it's healthy. So what you do is you take a sample and you compress it, literally like compress the skin. And you would measure before and after compression with optical coherence tomography. And you might get images like here. So that will be before compression and after compression, you can see a uniform sample with an inclusion. And then from these um, two images, our approach was to first reconstruct the displacement field that happens inside the object. And this displacement field contains information on the stiffness, the Young's modulus, the Poisson ratio, and so on. So the second inverse problem is to reconstruct the parameters from, from this displacement field. And uh, this has been a, a big work for Lisa and Kata here from our groups, we have done excellent work here. And there is some, just recently, we have managed to get the physics paper in IEEE on this top, topic, which I'm really happy about. So if you're interested. Okay. Good. And uh, our SP extends actually to a number of other collaborations, some of which I have written you here. Um, with them, we do brain imaging. ESO, you will see in a second, where we do adaptive optics. This is Microgate, the company in Italy who builds some stuff for the ESO and other things. There is a Doppler laboratory on ultrasound tomography by Otmar Scherzer. And this partner is in-house in Linz. This is a research center for non-destructive testing. And with them, we have been doing this phase contrast there at CT, which I'll be coming to short. Okay. Almost there. <laughs> 
yeah, it, it's nice. So I wanted to show you. I hope you're fine with that. One thing that Linz and uh, Rickham uh, are kind of good at is adaptive optics. And it's also a tomography problem on two different scales. And just a few words about that. You may know that the European Southern Observatory is currently building a large telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Okay, currently there is no telescope. There is only a kept mountain and a concreted base, but it's going to be built. And it is going to be a huge telescope with a, like a 40 meter diameter mirror. And it has one problem. Um, yes, 40 meter. It's huge. And uh, the big problem is, well, it's standing on Earth and not in, in, in space. And the problem is that light, which comes from an astronomical object, first has to pass the atmosphere before it reaches the telescope. And when it does so, the atmosphere is, has different temperatures, there's wind, it shifts, it causes aberrations, and these aberrations distort the image. And at this point, I maybe should say that it's not an image of an astronomical object, it's not a snapshot, like you don't record it just as it is, but you may need several hours to collect enough photons such that you'll get a nice image from 15 minutes to a couple of hours. So if you don't do anything about this blurring thing, you will never get a good um, reconstruction, particularly so because the atmosphere is changing at about one millisecond rate. So what you need to do is you need to kind of use wavefront sensors. Here's the pyramid wavefront sensor, which if this is the incoming light, it kind of, uh, okay, if light is coming in, it's focused on this prism, and then you get four pieces of data. So this would be a turbulence coming in. This would be what is measured. And from this, you reconstruct the wavefront, like the atmospheric turbulence, more or less. And then you apply and you use deformable mirrors. So in you form a mirror in such a way that light, after it reflects from such a deformable mirror, is again not aberrated. So you measure the aberration, you place a mirror, after reflection, the light is non aberrated. And in the end, you get good images. And um, well, you need to do this in real time. So every one millisecond, you need to solve three inverse problems. The wavefront reconstruction problem, the mirror problem, and then there is a tomography problem, which comes on the next slide. And if that doesn't work, then the telescope doesn't work. So a big part of the Linz experience is how to make this run. And in this project, the SFB, we found out or have, we have transferred because exact, they asked the adaptive optics here for space object is exactly the same or more in principle, it's exactly the same as if you were looking into the eye. Because if you look into the retina, rods and cones of a patient, light also needs to go through an atmosphere and the atmosphere is the eye, which is also rapidly moving and there is a liquid inside. And it's exactly the same thing. You also send light in, it comes out, it's measured by a wavefront sensor, you place deformable mirrors to correct for it to get sharp images. So this was a core thing to transfer this knowledge here from Blinz Group of Adaptive Optics to the ophthalmology setting. Um, yeah, maybe just, just a short while. So I told that there is an atmospheric tomography problem as well. So if you measure the incoming wavefront aberrations, and you correct for them, then you only correct in one direction, namely in the direction where you looked in. But what if you want to, what if you want to look, say, over a larger field of view? What if you want to watch multiple objects at once? Then you kind of need to find out how is the atmosphere behaving in an area above the telescope. So how do you do that? Well, you look at guide stars. This may be stars of which you know the position, or you may artificially create such a star by shooting a laser at 90 kilometers height. It then creates an artificial star that lights back down. And these stars, the light that comes down from them, you measure each with a wavefront sensor, and then you make a tomography of the atmosphere first. Boils down to a linear inverse problem with some nice uh, priors. So here you see. Uh, with these covariance matrices, you see a Bayesian approach hiding. And um, Bernadette Stadler from the Rickham Institute of Industrial Mathematics 
has worked with this company Microgate to actually implement this so that it runs on parallel CPUs and parallel GPUs so that it actually does work in two milliseconds time. And there are some restrictions, of course, which you may not expect at first because you thought, well, this is a very simple problem, right? It is, but not if you have to be this fast. So what they have developed in Linz is this part here is rather sparse in a wavelet basis, while this is rather sparse in a head basis. So you kind of do a preconditioned, or in this case, a yeah, conjugate gradient, where you, in each step you swap between a Fourier domain, like a wavelet domain and a space domain to apply both stuff fast and so on. There's, so like, there's a lot of practical considerations going into them. And I was told that parallel CPUs can sometimes be better than parallel GPUs because here the data transfer would make the GPU too slow. So it's like three seconds and that's milliseconds and that's too slow. Good. Yeah, no, stop. Just a second. I wanted to show you, before I told you that we have transferred the pyramid sensor to ophthalmology. And here you can see how such a thing would look like. So here's uh, one of our colleagues. She's sitting with, the, with her looking into a, to laser basically and here's all this stuff going on with the pyramid sensor which is only about this small and in the end you'll actually get a really really highly resolved pictures of your rod and cones and since it's optical coherent uh, yeah, coherence tomography also can look into the nerve of the eye and it's really nice because you can sit there and if the person moves you can actually see what's on the other part and so on so it's really cool good um I'll jump that one for a second. Yeah. Um, so I told you that we use this pyramid sensor and other sensors as well. And it, they are necessary for adaptive optics for the telescope because you can only measure intensities. And so you need to do something to get the phase because the phase contains the aberrations. However, if you use optical coherence tomography, that contains phase information. So you can try to compensate for aberrations without the wavefront sensor, which is called digital aberration correction. And we've just recently worked on, on that. And here on the left, you can see a sample of this, lots of small microbeads on the glass plate. And you just take, it's, it has of course a complex component, which I cannot depict here, but you run this through our algorithm and you get an aberration corrected image where suddenly you do see these yellow dots the microbeads as before. And uh, happy to report that just yesterday we got back that it's now in Siam Imaging accepted. So really happy about that. And maybe at the workshop in June, I can present a poster on the subject if anyone's interested. So enough about the SFB. I would like to focus now in more detail on the phase contrast terahertz city. All right. Why do we do it? Because of window frames. <laughs> this is a window frame in not optimal uh, arrangement, because as you can see, it's cut so that one can see the inner structure. And our colleagues from um, this research center for non-destructive testing, they want to, well, find a way to find defects in production lines for those window frames without optimally cutting them open. And to do so, they have settled on terahertz imaging. So you, like CT, you would send a terahertz beam through an object, rotate it as far as that's possible, and then reconstruct the internal structure of that object. And why terahertz? Well, because it's easier in a factory to place a terahertz scanner than it is to place a CT scanner because it, it would be, we don't want to have some radiation going on. And the terahertz setup, which I show you is actually rather small. So, so that's the motivation. And how would the schematic of such a terahertz tomography look like? The schematic is something like this. You have here a, a source which emits terahertz rays. Then it uh, goes on an optical parabolic mirror, which focuses the terahertz beam onto a sample, which is here. And this sample is then rotated. 
steroids passes through and is then focused on a single point detector. Okay. Originally, it looked something like this. So here's the source, the mirrors, that would be the sample, mirrors again, detector. And you see actually the size of such a sample is maybe a couple of centimeters. And so that was the very beginning of our project. And the problem was that this, this turning was rather slow. In the beginning, it took a couple of hours to record the sample. And that's of course suboptimal because temperature changes in the room, for example, can have an influence on the, on the quality. So what our physicist has done is he built this rather complicated apparatus where here in the middle, you still have this beam object vector. And I would like to show you a complete measurement setup as a small video. Video is actually a complete recording already. It records 180 angles and numerous, I think it was 100 parallel beams, if I'm not mistaken. So from six hours down to six seconds was quite nice. And it took our physicist, it was uh, basically it was a large part of his uh, PhD in physics to, to build this apparatus. Okay. Yeah. So now the question is, of course, we have recorded the data. Well, we have we have this experimental setup. What do we do with it? And of course, there are there are many uh, approaches which you could go. And of course, the first thing you can uh, think of is to use the Maxwell equations. It's it's definitely the general model or you can use some simplification, say the Helmholtz equation. And there are some works which, uh, so at the time of us writing this paper, these were two works which went in a, this direction. And um, so as far as I can tell, they work very well. How about it inver inverting from a full Helmholtz equation takes a lot of time or can take a lot of time. And maybe it requires in some, some of them, it required a bit of preliminary knowledge about the sample geometry. And we had the idea, maybe we can work on this project, uh, can do something about the problem with a much, much simpler model and found out that, well, it works very well regardless. So here is a, a bit more general approach and I will later tell in which situations maybe you should go for this more general approach. And I will show you why for our specific sample, uh, for specific setup, remember we are scanning window frames, plastic pieces, why this simpler model may be a good alternative. Okay, first things first, unlike in um, CT, we are, the assumption that the terahertz ray is a straight line isn't always realistic because the terahertz beam has a profile and that is its profile. So it has most energy at the center, but it isn't a nice delta peak, so to say. You can invest, and we have later done so in lasers which have a more delta-like appearance, but of course this is expensive and the more focused it is, the more expensive it gets. Then we had an observation. So this is a nice triangular sample and we can send a terahertz beam through. And let's say it goes, doesn't actually pass the sample. Then it would look something like this. It's a terahertz pulse. And if it passes through the sample, it's more or less a similar pulse, which is damped and delayed. Okay, all right, that, that looks strangely like, strangely familiar. Maybe we can do something with that. And this was the start of our rather simplified model. So, Let's say we have a terahertz beam, which is imagined as a bundle of, of rays passing through with a, with a, which have this profile, which I showed you. And then we say, okay, we say what comes out at the other end, 
is the thing that goes in, delayed and dampened. And the I and J stand for a parallel line and for an angle. So for each angle and parallel line, the field that goes out is the field that went in with a delay and a damping. And the delay and the damping, of course, through the medium. Okay, after the beam has passed through the object, we have this E out field, and it is focused onto a single point detector. So we just integrate along its spatial width that's modeled by this integration. And then uh, also a physical assumption that the energy loss of the terahertz beam is roughly proportional to the density of the medium, density in this case being F. So then we have this classic law, which gives us the damping as this exponential factor. And here is, yeah, the, here's the radon transform inside. So we plug here this quantity inside. And here was this time delay. So we place the time delay inside. And we end up here with this model. Good. So a word about this assumption. That really works well because we have plastic samples, which are in a range of um, absorption where this is roughly valid. So if that wouldn't be valid, if you had a different material, or well, uh, have a large range of coefficients, then one of the other models is preferable. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. We get them, but they are very small. The problem, as you will see, is more on borders, uh, on uh, corner points. But so far, um, so far, the multiple reflections haven't been uh, neglected yet because this is still a full time signal. Okay, so the ingoing field, remember, it had a certain profile. Let's call this profile this point. So it's a pulse in time and it's its expansion extension in space. So you say what goes in is this combination between the weight, the weight being the shape of the profile times the, the signal going in time. Okay, so you plug this in here and I'll point out here as noted, the weight can be measured this by just pass letting the beam pass through air and measuring this profile and the reference field, you can also measure the reference field of a terahertz beam going through space. Okay, so this is the most general simple model we came up with. And you can see that, okay, this is the date that we measure. We can measure them. And well, everything is kind of known here except this time delay. And we have investigated a number of different ways to deal with this time delay. And I'm gonna present you some and then tell you what worked best in our case. And there are some open possibilities which maybe I'm also rushing on the side. So the first thing is you could, if you look here, if you just integrate here with respect to time, then the time doesn't delay just falls away. And then you have kind of lost something because you have integrated over your signal, but uh, you also don't need to worry about this time delay anymore. You can look at intensities. Intensities would be something like this. And then you can see, under some other stuff, which come on the next slide, that you get nonlinear and linear problems which can be handled. Or you can look at the delay. The delay is, you see, there's just a T here in addition. And that will be in the end what has worked best. And I will come, come back to it. And you can say, okay, or well, maybe I know that the terahertz beam has a certain spatial width, but what if we assume that it doesn't? And um, Sometimes that actually works very well as too. good. So first things first, let's integrate out the, the time shift. So we just integrate here and call this integrated left-hand side Pij and the integrated field here, Pref. And you see that we end up with a classic nonlinear inverse problem for the density F, which should resemble you spect and can more or less be handled in a similar way. And one of the first things we did was to run some nonlinear reconstruct reconstructors on this problem. 
However, you can be faster and achieve better results. So one thing you can do is you can say, you can say, okay, maybe my terahertz beam is rather narrow. So I do approximate its profile by a delta peak. And then I can, as the advantage that then the integral falls and part of the integrals here vanish. And you can then actually look at the intensities and then you will find out that actually it's just a linear problem involving the radon transform and the intensities of the terahertz beam here. So the classic CT model. And the curious thing is that physicists have used this for reconstructing, but they have just used it because it made sense kind of to look at a sinogram maybe. And now we actually kind of have an idea, or at least we have an idea now, why it wasn't a bad idea of what the physicists have been doing all along. However, what worked best was the following observation. So if you remember our plastic sample, it only consisted of one material and air. So your density F, the density F is just only two values can, which you can take on. And in this case, you can find an explicit expression for, for the time delay, which we have before just integrated away. Namely, you can use the velocity equals distance times time. The time is the delay. The distance is the radon transform because the radon transform for a material of only one, um, uh, one parameter is exactly the length at which it, which a beam passes through. And the velocity, you know, because it's the, it is related to the refractive index. So you get an expression for this time delay and you could plug it in here and you get now a problem where everything is known on the right-hand side and you could reconstruct from here. We haven't done that because it's, a bit annoyingly nonlinear, but you can say if you have a narrowly focused beam, then you can, it turns out that you can compute the time shift and it is exactly this time delay, this exactly related to this time delay of the terahertz signal. So you have two expressions, this for the time delay and this, and you set them equal, and you again end up with a linear inverse problem with the Radon transform, where now the right hand side is a specific uh, time delay quantity. And the good thing is that our physicists said, Yeah, I like the time delay because I understand what it does. It turns out that you don't, it's very robust with respect to noise in our case. It was also rather insensitive with respect to reflect this multiple reflections. And while at the intensity-based approaches on the slide before, we had to do a little data pre-processing. Here, we basically didn't have to do any data pre-processing to make it work. So if you happen to scan a window frame with terahertz tomography, I suggest that you compute this time delay quantities and then run your inversion formula for the radon transform. Good. And now I would like to show you some examples of what we did. So on the left, you see one of our terahertz samples. And uh, this was 3D printed in-house. And first of all, so this would be the top left, would be a sinogram if you took the intensities. And below would be a sinogram if you take the, it's called pulse phase, the time delay. And then a, a classic filtered back projection reconstruction. And you can see that if you do a classic filtered back projection on your delay sinogram, then you actually get a really nice reconstruction of the terahertz sample. So this is actual data recorded with the setup I showed you before. Um, we tried this for a number of different samples. And you can see that in general, the shape is very nicely reconstructed. What you can also see is that here in the corners, it's actually a, a much higher value. Now this could have multiple reasons. One reason could be that in 3D printing, such connector points may get a denser material. It's one thing that the physicists have said. The other- You can't see it, that right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can understand. Well, it, yes, it's possible. 
And uh, the other thing is that, of course, in the corners, there may happen some other phenomena, like uh, diffraction and so on, and maybe some scattering. And these are not included in the model. So, of course, we cannot see them. However, for our purposes, this is good enough because we don't really want to know kind of uh, is there, is it red here or is it blue? We want to see is there material or isn't there material? That's what we are interested in. Okay, uh, yeah. Perhaps one thing that we are investigating at the moment is could we maybe, so for the reconstruction, there was this prior information that it's zero material wasn't included. So what if we include that in the reconstruction procedure? Maybe some of this vanishes as well. But this is ongoing. Okay, so a physicist was interested, does it actually also reproduce distances nicely? Like if this thing is two millimeters thick, is the reconstruction two millimeters thick more or less? And the answer is sometimes. And here, for example, you can see that in this case, it's within 10% of two millimeters. While you can see that if it's a, such a spiral structure, it decreases, the quality decreases towards the middle, where exactly such phenomena like refraction and so on may play a large role. Okay, um, something where it doesn't work so well. So our physicist has tried a number of different refractive indices in plastic. And I'm, the unfortunate thing is that I'm not exactly sure which of the reconstructors he run. And uh, I would maybe like to try it myself if it becomes a bit better. But you can see here there's some, some stuff going on here. So if there are multiple refractive indices, maybe we need to look at the time delay and say, okay, the time delay should be a sum of different delays depending on the refractive indices and then work with that. But that wasn't yet, it was simply not timely. However, one thing that um, did work very nicely is, so I told you that towards the center, it uh, became a little worse or became worse. So for example, this should all be two millimeter thick, but here towards the center, it's like three millimeter thick and that's not so good. And what the physicists did was they said, well, we, if it's a window frame, we know how it should look like if it wasn't destroyed. So we can take this as a priori information. And he did a, a full Maxwell-based ray tracing or a full ray tracing of the model and use this, like you, you do a ray tracing and you get kind of where the terahertz beams would move in a non-destroyed sample. And you use this as lines over which the Radon transform integrates more or less. And then you use this for reconstruction. And then you kind of see that you, you do get much better here as previously. So this ray tracing does help you out. Okay, then I'm gonna say, well, what if, I mean, I, I want to find the defect if I go in with the correct geometry, what, what happens if, if it's destroyed? The answer is it, it detects it anyways. It is just a nice a priori information for the algorithm to run. I mean, if none of the object were left, then of course it wouldn't detect it. But if there is a, a crack or a, some, some, some bit chipped out, then it does fine. And in fact, you can do this fully 3D. So we had here a plastic sample, which had an opening crack and you can reconstruct it in 3D. That's what happens here. And if you look here at this front side that's depicted on fast here, you can kind of see that the reconstruction more or less caught the crack and the gaps, which is here, the gaps here are corresponding in, in the size to what we actually measure with the, with the scale afterwards. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I'm already at the end of the presentation. So if you're interested in our results for this terahertz tomography, then here are two publications. This was for mathematics um, oriented. This was more physics oriented and a recent uh, paper of our collaborators where they talk a little bit about, um, about this ray tracing idea. And uh, with this, I would 
like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Cool. Like in the thing that you mentioned at the end, where you build a, a model to modify the rate tracing, it seems like you can have some sort of iterative scheme where you update your rate tracing model. Mm -hmm. How about that? Mm -hmm. So that's that's something we have been thinking of exactly like this. Yes, the difficulty for the moment, and maybe there are some good solutions. Is if you reconstruct, you reconstruct on well on some pixel grid more or less, or and then where is the border? So of your reconstruction, you maybe have an object which has like pixely things. You would still need to draw a border to then go get us the input for the ray tracing next step. So you could either do like a Direct, hmm? yeah, exactly. Or some contour tomography type thing, but that it wasn't yet, uh, we didn't yet have the time for that. But yes, exactly. Plus, you also said you didn't want to do ray tracing because you want the quicker, and so you didn't yes. want to do full wave inversion. Yes, you know, like you can go so far before it's too But this depends on which. So, what they want to go for in the end is to make it inline, so let the thing pass through once. And that's it. And in a yeah. couple of seconds, it should tell you is it correct or not. And then it may be a bit too much. Okay. So just the last um, slide, well, slide before this. One. This one? Yeah. So, so presumably you're rotating it with the axis of almost simply. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, what happens if you try and rotate it in a different way? Is, is the algorithm robust? Um, um, you mean if it goes like a spiral around or? Because your window frame not that, right? So you can yeah. Yeah. Um, well, if the whole thing's a little bit off center, that doesn't throw it. If you went in a spiral in 3D, I cannot tell you because we haven't done that yet. So if you stick the axis through the side of that, rotate it like like this. Yeah, you gotta be curious. <laughs> we can try it. Yeah, because it might give insight into why some features seem brighter than mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. you know, just... mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the beam doesn't seem that narrow, and uh, mm -hmm. with most tomography problems that, that you have this log in, in them, uh, you get this exponential edge effect, right? So, mm -hmm. so in other words, if you consider all the rays going through your beam, uh, and, and then you integrate the exponential mm -hmm. of those, uh, the integral of the log, mm -hmm. then uh, you can't undo that by taking the log. Mm -hmm. So you, you get this uh, nonlinear partial volume effect or exponential edge effects because the, the problems then become nonlinear. But I think it's, you've got quite a big beam. It seems mm -hmm. to me that you suffer from that. It, maybe it mm -hmm. explains some of your Yes, and I have been slightly cheating you because that uh, beam which I showed you was a, from where we had still the cheaper laser. So <laughs> it would be a bit narrower now. But you are correct that it has this, uh, it has still some extension. And that's why we would be interested to try, uh, what I showed you, to maybe reconstruct from the this model where yeah. you not have all the simplification. I mean, it actually looks a bit like beam hardening or exponential edge effect already, right? Because mm -hmm. it's an integral over something of e to the right on the thing you get in both of them. While I'm on this slide, so we've had. A look at what if you take here more than one material different refractive indices and there is like a formula you can then plug into here as well but it was a eu project running for two years and then two years were over and uh, we are currently trying to maybe find some more funding to be able to to do it because as and you saw yes but if it were something like this pipe yeah then yeah for the moment, but now we know what we do, we can catch you and freeze you more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.